Thank you, Dave. Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you here. Again, for your visitors, we are happy that you're here with us as, as well. Let me just say to those of you who turned out yesterday for our work day at our new property, thank you so much for being there. We were able to accomplish a lot. We must have picked up a couple of tons of, of rocks or cement and things of that nature. But anyway, uh, if you came, uh, thank you so much for being there. It was a, it was a, a good time had by by all this morning i'm going to be sharing with you a lesson that is really important to us as a congregation and so i'm going to kind of give you a warning right up front here that the remainder of our service is going to be longer than what it normally is and for that i apologize but we have a number of announcements that are very important to our congregation because they have very serious uh, tangible um thoughts to go along with them and so uh, i certainly want to uh, beg your 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 indulgence and your patience as well and for you younger mothers who have babies uh since it's going to go a little bit long don't be too hard on them you know so you know if they get kind of squirming around and feel like you can get up and walk around with them or whatever okay so let's go ahead and, and get into our lesson uh, this this morning here are these, these words here we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the and their pursuit of happiness so begins the second paragraph and the very most recognized sentence of the declaration of independence you know we live in an incredibly wonderful nation we're probably one of the greatest nations in world's history though we are yet a fairly young nation in terms of history itself you might notice the very words that Thomas Jefferson penned as he wrote the Declaration of Independence. There he talked about their creator. From the very inception of our country, our country was started with and recognized that there was a creator, that God was very important in life. And because of him, we have the rights that we enjoy as a country. In fact, our country from its very inception was established upon the principles of Judeo-Christian beliefs and, and faith that are laid out by, for us by the word of God. The founders of our country were men who believed in God. There are men who believed in the word of God and formed our constitution after the very oracles of God and insisted upon them being parts of the fabric of our new democracy, if you will. Let me share with you some of the statements that were made by founding fathers as well as others. I could say to you that I could go on for probably, seriously, probably an hour and a half, just one, you know, quote after another of what men had to say about our country and the belief in our country. Friend of John Quincy Adams, sixth president of the United States. The highest glory of the American Revolution was that it was connected to the principles of Christianity with the principles of government. Thomas Jefferson. Can the liberties of a nation be thought secure if we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of men that these liberties are a gift from God? Alexander Hamilton, 1787, after the Constitutional Convention. For my own part, I sincerely esteem it, the Constitution, a system which without the finger of God never could have been suggested and agreed upon by such a diversity of interests. George Washington, first president. The propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on, expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. John Adams and John Hancock, founding fathers. We recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. Obviously, they were speaking in you know, in opposition to King George and, of course, England it, itself. But nevertheless, you see where God was in their minds. More recently would be Ronald Reagan's words, 40th president of the United States. Without God, there is no virtue because there is no prompting of the conscience. Without God, there is, no cor there is a coarsening of the society. Without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be one nation or a nation gone under. Pretty strong words. Not only were these words held and thoughts held by men of our nation, but even foreigners who would come to our country and, and would look at the success of the country would also talk about these things. One such man was Alexand Ale Alexius uh, Ducoville. There are Ducoville. There he said these words. I sought for the greatness 
and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample, river, ample rivers. It was not there in her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. In her rich mines and in her vast world commerce, it was not there. In her democratic congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand that the secret of her genius and power, America is great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she'll cease to be great. Why is America good? America is good because God is good because his word is good and by because the people who follow after his standard of belief are good people but the winds of change are quickly upon us the landscape of our nation is changing in many ways the social culture has changed the climate has changed and god has begun to be pushed out of society and in its place, man is starting to put himself in its place to determine what is right and what is, is wrong. That's what's happening to our nation today. Since the beginning of our country, our country has waged numerous wars, not only on our own fields, but on foreign fields as well. We have a long history of wars where men have let, have let blood flow upon the field of, of battle. You can go all the way back to the French and Indian War, to the Revolutionary War, to the Civil War. You can talk about the Spanish-American War. You can talk about the Indian Wars that, lost, that lasted over 25 years in our nation. There was World War I and World War II. There was Korea. There was Vietnam. There was the Persian Gulf War. There was the invasion of Iraq and then Afghanistan. There are numerous other ones that you, we pr 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 could probably talk about, That these probably are the most recognized of all. But there is a war that has been waged today in our country that is probably the most devastating and threatens to tear the very fabric of who we are as a nation completely apart. It's one that has been waged for a number of years. Certainly by the time you get into the 19th and 20th century, 20th century is without a doubt, 21st century for sure, there's a war that threatens us. And it's not a war that has anything to do with, with, with physical weaponry or, or anything. It's a war of ideas. It's a war of values. It's a war of philosophy. It's a war of religion to some degree. The war that I'm talking about is the culture war. The culture war is a very real kind of thing. When I talk about culture war, I mean by culture war, the conflict between traditional and conservative values as opposed to progressive and, and liberal values. The first time the culture wars became really a real reality in terms of the political scene and the cultural scene happened in 1991 when a fellow by the name of James Daniel Hunter wrote a book called The Culture Wars, The Struggle to Define America. And there he talked about the political polarization of the various kinds of issues that were entering into our culture that was threatening to tear it apart in many kinds of ways. Such discussions such as abortion, or the federal, state, and gun laws, global warming, immigration, separation of church and state, privacy, rec recreational drug use, homosexuality, censorship, along with a vast number of other kinds of, of things. To be honest with you, when I look at those things as a Christian, a lot of those things up there mean very little to me as a Christian. I mean, it's not that I don't have opinions about almost all of them, but there are some up there that when it comes to being a Christian, who I am and who you are, then they have me alarmed and have caused great concern. The question that enters into my mind when I think about the culture war is this. Who do you think is winning the war? Who do you think is winning the war when you look at those kinds of things there? What's the problem? What is the problem of the war? Well, the war has been brought about by God being pushed out of society, being left out of our society in his place. Man has started to set himself as the one who determines what is right and wrong, what is good and evil, what is moral and immoral. That's what's happening in our nation. And the question that comes to my mind is, is okay, if that's true, where does, where does God and country meet in the culture war? In other words, how are we as citizens, uh, how are we to address the culture war as citizens of the kingdom of God? Well, at the same time being citizens of the United States. I mean, 
Are we to be at odds with our nation? Are we to be at odds with our, our government? Or are we to live in harmony with it? Are we to live and work within the process that is there for us as, as citizens of the United States? Well, that's what I'm going to try to answer this morning for you. In fact, I don't have to answer it for you. I believe that God has already answered it for us. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. As you turn to that section of Scripture... Let me tell you that when Paul wrote about this, he wrote about Christians and he wrote about, wrote about country. And as he talked about country, he talked about how we as Christians are to conduct ourselves as a citizen of a government. And to Paul, it didn't, remi didn't bother him which kind of government you were, were talking about. To him, it didn't matter whether you were talking about a, a monarchy or an oligarchy or, or communism or socialism or a democracy. That wasn't his issue. He believed that what he, the principles that he was going to lay down are principles that fit, would fit well in any era of, of time. Understand that when Paul wrote these words that he lived under the Roman hobnailed sandals of the Roman Empire. That had conquered the, at least the known world at, at that time. Uh, there was a new emperor that had come on scene by the name of Nero who would eventually make Christianity illegal, if, if you will, and we begin the persecution of Christians all over the land. The same government that Paul talked about would be the same government and was the same government that crucified our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on a cross. It would be the same government that Paul would talk about in good ways that eventually would behead him, would execute him because of his belief and his convictions of his faith and his following of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, here's what he said about government and how we are to work within it. Listen to it. Romans 13, beginning in verse 1. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities. The word authority means the powers that be. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinances of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For the rulers do not are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God for you for, to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon those who practice evil. Wherefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now over, open your Bibles to 1 first, first Peter, the second chapter. 1 Peter chapter 2. This is Peter writing under the same government rule of his day. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. So here you have the very foundation of how we are to live our lives in the culture war. And in this section of scripture, what Paul says is that God is so sovereign over all governments that exist. And the very first thing that he teaches is that governments are established by God himself. Notice what he says in verse 1. There he says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except. Well, except what? Except that God has established them. Now, that doesn't mean that Vladimir Putin or that Stalin or that Hitler or that Saddam Hussein or for even that matter, Ronald Reagan or Barack or Obama are used as puppets on God's string. What it does mean is that God has established the principle that government is to be in charge of society. But why is that? Because without it, you would have chaos. You would have chaos that would run rampant. And that which is immoral would not be restrained whatsoever because of that very thing. What I'm saying to you is that God is able to accomplish his will in all kinds of governments. 
He's able to do that. He's proved it down through history. In Daniel, the second chapter and verse 21, there it says that God removes kings and he sets them up. Or Romans, the ninth chapter and verse 17, there it says, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. In other words, God had allowed a wicked man as Pharaoh to rule over his people in order that he might bring good for his people. God can use all kinds of government to bring about his message. He used governments that we would not disagree with, we would, or would agree with. We would not agree with the Grecian government. We would not have agree, agreed with the, the Roman government and their morals and the things of that nature. And yet God could use them to advance his call. Rome established the greatest road system in the world, connecting the known world together with one another. The Pax Romana, a world peace where the gospel could easily go throughout the entire known world. Or through Greek, the Greeks came language and culture, Koine a Greek, the language of commerce by which we could talk to everyone on the face of the planet and, and communicate of which your Bible was written in that very language itself. And certainly the New Testament, the Old Testament, though, was written in Hebrew and some Aramaic was later in the Septuagint or the LXX was translated into Koine Greek. So it became a way in which God could cause his will or allow his will to be done. Of course, when we think about governments and so forth we of course think about democracy and we think about our form of democracy it might surprise you that we are not a pure democracy in the greatest sense but that we are a republic so what is the difference between the two well in a pure democracy every vote at the ballot box counts on every issue in other words you vote on every single issue some have called it mob rule if you will then a republic, though, is a little bit different. In a the republic, we democratically choose representatives who best represents our ideas or our values. And that they then vote and make law according to those dictates and, and so forth. But they are free to do so. Now, that form of democracy has worked really well for us in the United States for 240 years. So to some degree, it is a good thing. But here's the thing, all forms of democracy are only as good as the people who make them up. Because we are free to think and we are free to choose. If the people become evil, immoral, and violent, then the government becomes evil, immoral, or violent. If the people are good and moral and upright and righteous, then you'll have a government that is good, upright, moral, and righteous. The founders of our nation were men who saw God as the standard for living life of what is good, moral, upright, and, and righteous. And so that became part of who we are as a nation. We become the envy of the world ar around us. People who have so much less than we have are envious of who we are as a nation. But why have we become a great nation? It's my opinion and my conviction that we have become a great nation because God was at the very forefront of who we are as a nation. Jamestown, the very first settlement in our country, put a church building right in the middle of the settlement and everything happened around or revolved around God being in that community of, of people. The most early establishments of our colleges were Yale and Harvard. They were established in order to train preachers to preach the gospel and bring it into the entire known world. If you were to go to Washington, D.C. and go, go into our governmental buildings, you'll find scripture after scripture inscribed upon the walls there. Congress begins every session with a prayer. And if you were to pull out the money out of your pocket, you would see these words, In God we trust. There's something about God being a part of who we are and what we are as a nation of, of people. Yes, we are a democracy, but our democracy is only as good as we who make up the democracy in which we live this very day. But as I said to you, the winds of, of change are coming. Arnold Toyby, a recognized historian, said, of the 22 civilizations that I have studied, 19 of them fell not because of external forces, but because of the internal moral decay. In other words, what he was saying is that we are rotting from the inside is what he, he said, and that's what destroys a nation or brings a nation down. I have to tell you that I'm concerned about our country. I believe that we are still the greatest country in the world. I'm glad that I am a citizen of it, but I think that we have lost our moral compass 
in terms of God, God being the one who guides us through things and helping us to make laws. It's for this cause that I think Paul addressed this very thing because he lived in the same kind of society probably who asked themselves that same kind of question. How can we as Christians submit to this kind of a government? And Paul says you can if you recognize who is sovereign over all things. So the question that came to my mind as I read what Paul said in Romans the 13th chapter is, is what then is the, the purpose of government? And Paul said, listen, there is a purpose of government. In fact, he says there are two purposes of government. The first one, he says, is that government is that which does good. Look at the very first, the fourth verse of this section here. There it says, for he is God's servant to do you good. So what is the government supposed to do? Well, the government is supposed to serve the people. That's what it is, it's to take that which we do not have and help us in those areas of our lives. Government is to be placed where we can pull our resources in order to provide services that we cannot provide for ourselves. We pay taxes and the government builds parks. It builds bridges, it builds roads and sewers and playgrounds and education and higher education and uh, uh, military and, and, and so many other things that allow us to live a tranquil and peaceful life in this world that in many ways is topsy-turvy in life. But it also exists for another reason, and that is our government is to promote freedom. And one of the freedoms that it promotes is the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. The greatest amendment that we have is the very first amendment in our Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibition of free exercise thereof or abridging of freedom of speech or of the press, etc., etc. Notice what those words said there. There it says that no establishment of a religion. What were the founders talking about? Well, I believe the founders were talking about that there should be no national religion upon which the, the state pays homage to. In other words, I would be just as afraid of a Church of Christ Pope as I would be of a Catholic Pope. And I think the founders of our nation understood that very thing, but they were not talking about the separation of church and state. In fact, I will say to you that I'll give anyone in here a, an expense paid, free expense paid vacation to Hawaii if you can find that in the constitution of separation of church and state. It's a red herring. It does not exist. Our founders understood that. They obviously assumed that the standards of God would play a prominent role in who we are as a nation and what we are as a nation. And if not as a nation, then certainly as a people who live in this nation that we call home. You've probably heard these words here, that no one can, um, that no one can legislate morality. That really is true. So government exists for the purpose of doing good, but it also does good for the restraining of evil. Government is to make sure that evil does not rule the land. Government is to squelch by the laws and powers of government anything that is evil. That's part of what it is all about. You cannot legislate morality. You cannot legislate and make people good, but you can legislate against immorality. Let me share with you what I mean. You can't legislate for people to love me or to love you, but you can legislate people from killing you. Or killing me you can't legislate and make people honest in this world but you can make legislation that forbids people from stealing from me government cannot make you good but it can take care of the evil that is around you my concern is that our government seems to have lost focus on restraining evil and is more focused on forcing tolerance of the evil that surrounds us things that I think challenge us to our our very core. The winds of change are blowing almost at gale forces in, in areas such as marriage and sexuality. I don't know if you have noticed much about how words change, how are changing in our nation that words used to be culturally valuable and so forth. Take the word marriage itself. Go all the way back to Noah Webster, 1828, the first dictionary, if you will. Look at the definition of marriage and how he saw it as compared to maybe how we see it today. Marriage is a contract, both civil and religious, by which parties engage to live together in mutual affection and fidelity until death shall separate them. Marriage was instituted by God himself. 
for the purpose of preventing the promiscuous intercourse of the sexes, for promoting domestic fidelity and for securing the maintenance and education of children. And then he adds to it, Hebrews the 13th chapter and verse 4, marriage is to be held honorable among all. Fast forward to 1996 when that definition changed a lot. It could have been after President Bill Clinton signed into the law DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, in which marriage was defined as between a man and a woman. Here is 1996 definition by Merriam Webster. A mutual relation of a husband and wife by which men and women are joined in a special kind of social and legal dependence for the purpose of building and maintaining a family. That's quite a bit different from Noah Webster's de definition back in 1828, is it? Notice the things that are missing there, civil and religious. Until death shall separate them, instituted by God, promiscuous intercourse of the sexes. Marriage is to be honored among all. We have come, as an old adage would say, or maybe it was a commercial, we've come a long way, baby. Fast forward 19 years from 1996 to June 15, 2015, the Supreme Court of the United States in Oberfell versus Hodge. Notice how it began to change very drastically how marriage was changed. A landmark decision that made it constitutional, citing the 14th Amendment to legalize the issuance of marriage license to same-sex couples and to recognize same-sex marriages with, with, throughout all of the United States. This law, in essence, said that any public place of accommodation or services rendered that refused to issue a same-sex license or to perform a same-sex marriage would be criminally liable by, by law. So the definition changes again from 1996 to 2015. Here is Webster's definition. The state of being united to a person of the opposite sex as husband or wife in a consensual and contractual relationship recognized by law. Not recognized by God, but by law. The state of being united to a person of the same sex in a relationship that of, that of a traditional marriage, same sex marriage. That's from Merriam's Webster, Webster's dictionary of what marriage is defined as. You can't tell me that we're not in a culture war. The only question is, is who's winning it? Or is God giving to us what we ask for? Our democracy, or our republic is only as good as the people who dwell within it. Ronald Reagan said that very th same thing. He said that we were the conscience of our nation, which says to me that, you know, we're not the masters of the state, nor is the state the master of us, but we are a conscience to what goes on in our country, and we must not sit back and be silent about who we are and what we are as Christians, but that we are to make our voices heard through due process and so forth. So, what should our response be as, as kingdom citizens and as citizens of the United States? I think I've already said to you that I think that, or at least I wrote it and I didn't say it, but that I believe that the greatest citizens of these United States should be Christian citizens. I believe that we should be upright people, obedient and submissive to our, our, our government. So what about Christians and your government? What did Paul have to say about those things? Well, notice verse 1 of Romans, thir Romans 13. Christians are to be submissive to the governing authorities. In other words, what they're saying is that everyone must submit himself or herself to the authorities, that Christians are to be submissive to the authorities, even if there are things that we don't agree with. You may have your views about global warming, but that's not really a spiritual issue. You may have your issues about immigration. That is not a spiritual issue. You may have, you know, your opinions about gun laws, but that is not a spiritual issue. There are those things that are spiritual issues, abortion, homosexuality, and things of that nature. Those should be things that are drastically changing the landscape, the climate of who we are as a nation. And so how are we to live within it? Well, Paul says Christians are to be submissive to the governing authorities, which means what? Well, that we are to pay for our government, that we are to pay our, our taxes. Paul says, render 
Custom to whom custom is due, tax to whom tax is due, fear to whom fear is due, and honor to whom honor is due. Even our Lord says, listen, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. Custom and taxes are here to stay, and you should be glad for them. Because if you didn't have them, you wouldn't have these nice roads that you live on, ride on. You would have roads like they have in Africa. Where you ride through potholes that could swallow up your car and are dusty and you have to take a shower when you get back from just a five minute ride in the place. You should be happy that you have sewers that are below ground instead of above ground running out into the ocean or into our, our rivers. You should be thankful that you have a, a, an army or a military that protects you and protects your freedom so that you can live in domestic tranquility, pay your taxes. That was, that's what Christians do. We're to pray for our, our government. You may not like congressmen or representatives. You may not like the president of the United States or the vice president, past or those who might be in the future. You may not respect them, but you ought to respect the position because God has put them in that position for whatever reason. Maybe it's because we asked for it or because he says we're going to need this, but nevertheless, they are there. And so Paul says, I urge then, first of all, that requests and prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made on, on behalf for everyone, for kings and those who are in authority, that we might live a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our savior. We need to pray for our government governing authorities we are to praise our government honor all people love the brotherhood fear god honor the king our government has kept us safe and free for 240 years did the case kept us safe from terrorist attacks at 1911 we need to praise our government for the good things that it does do because it does do a lot of really good things for us we need to preach to our, our government. There's times when we have to, to call things as they are, but it's nothing new because as you read through the scriptures, you'll find that there are godly men who preach to the government. Elijah, he preached to King Ahab. Eleazar preached to King Jehoshaphat. Daniel preached to Nebuchadnezzar. Moses preached to Pharaoh. John the Baptist to Herod. Jesus to uh, Pontius Pilate. Paul to King Agrippa. As long as our, there are things that are immoral in our country and are not politically correct, they need to be preached against. We need to make our voices heard in a real kind of way. We need to participate in our government. We need to get up off our seats of apathy and make our voices heard. Certainly at the ballot box, I read somewhere that there are over 80 million people who claim to be evangelicals or Christians who can vote or have the privilege of voting in these states, of the, who, those who are going to be our governing officials. Do you know that less than two thirds of those people voted last time around? If all 80 percent or 80 million would vote, we would turn the election around. Instead of being those who say, you know what, God's going to do what he wants to do. Well, God may do that, but he's put you in a land where you're free to make a difference and free to, to vote. Listen. You've heard me, you know, I'm not a political person. I don't believe in a lot of politics from the pulpit, okay? But when it comes to this kind of thing, I always tell people when they get wound up because they watch too much Fox News or too much MSNBC or any of those things, listen, you get one vote. Make it count. Or you can write your representative or your congressman. Put it to pen to paper. You can stand before the legislature and let your thoughts be known when they give you an audience to do so. Or you can run for office. That's what your options are. But listen, don't sit back and just say, let someone else do it. Pull your own lever, color in your own dot or whatever you have to do. Participate in your government. Why is that? Because we are of the people and by the people and for the people. We are the people. We count in our, in our country as Christians. And we need to stand up and be there. There's one exception to governmental submission one exception to that rule is that whenever the law of the land is in conflict with the laws of god we are to obey the law of god and not the law of the land and there's plenty plenty of scriptural precedents for this very thing found in the scripture when daniel was told that he was not to pray that was the law of the land but God said, pray, and Daniel disobeyed the law of the land, and he prayed. He paid the price for it, but he prayed. 
When John and Peter were told by the Sanhedrin that they were not to preach any more in the name of Jesus, that was the law of the land. But they said to them, if it is right in the sight of God, you be the judge, for we cannot help but speak what we have seen and heard. They disobeyed the law of the land. There are times when we come in conflict with the law. When that happens, we need to make a stand. We need to stand up for what we know is good and right and moral and just. I'm here to tell you that the winds of change are here among us and the moral landscape has changed and it's time for you to stand. I was listening to John Duberry, who's a congressman out of Tennessee, who's a Christian, was that Tahoe family encampment. He was talking to us about these kinds of things. They said that they're running hard against them, that he refused to support Hillary Clinton uh, because of some of her social moral views and so forth. He is a Democratic representative, by the way. And he says they have unleashed the dogs on him because of that. Running ads, hate ads at him, saying he is a hate monger, that he is a bigot, that he is a racist, and all kinds of things. What he said is to us, he says, you people better get ready to stand. It is your time. It is your time that you may have to suffer. It may be your time where you go to jail. It may be your time where certain things that you have once appreciated and had it held as a luxury will be gone from you. You as Christians, you must take a stand. I said to you at the beginning of the lesson that I had some important announcements to make to you. Announcements that I think directly affects our congregation. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, that the church today finds itself on the front lines of the, of the culture war. There's no doubt that social and cultural and moral landscape and climate of our country has drastically changed, placing the church and those who ch serve the church at, at risk. Ever since the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that states must recognize same-sex marriage as a constitutional law of the land, they have potentially put at risk any church building who refuses to allow same-sex marriage to be performed at, at risk, civilly speaking. And any preacher or elder who refuses to perform a same-sex marriage can be criminally held by law. It could become even a hate speech or a hate crime it, itself. Those things have begun to happen. And so there is a possibility that we could be held if we refuse to render such kinds of association. However, the court also implied that restrictions by churches based on long-held religious beliefs and convictions, they could be valid. In other words, what they're saying is that, what they're saying is that um, courts do not interpret scripture. If you go in and say, well, listen, here's why, we, why I could not perform a same-sex marriage, here's what the Bible says, they would say to me, we don't interpret scripture. We interpret law. What is your law that says that you can hold to this religious belief. Maybe it could be out of precedence. I don't, I don't know, but that question is there. What they were saying by the legal experts is that, is that uh, um, we could develop uh, written policies that clearly state our beliefs and that in a legal court of law, they would hold some, some weight. So here's what has happened. Our eldership was made aware of this a little over a year ago. And since that time, for the last year, we have been working on church policies for our congregation to protect our First Amendment right of freedom of religious expression and freedom of speech. And so we've developed a, a set of policies to do this very thing. Now, these policies are not a creed. They're not a church manual. Let me repeat, these policies are not a creed and not a church manual. The Bible is our sole rule of authority, will always be, has always been, and will continue to be. So the policies simply integrate scripture within those stated guidelines. This is what is on the very front page of a document that you're going to be, that's going to be made available to you as a body of believers. It's 17 pages long. It says these words, this document is intended as a formal acknowledgement of the authority of the Bible to guide all of our decisions and is also intended to constitute evidence in any legal proceeding as to our commitment and as to our dispute resolution practices before any dispute arises. So it begins with a table of, of contents, a statement of faith, 
The Bible is our only authority. Jesus Christ, our only hope. The church, the blood-bought body of believers, what constitutes that. Membership, the placing of church membership under the oversight of the local eldership. Worship, an avenue of respect and thanksgiving, laying out how we worship and what we do when we worship. Sin being our greatest enemy. Other eight statements are the statement of a final authority for matters of faith and conduct. Statements on marriage, gender, and sexuality. Statements on the sanctity of life. Statements on church discipline. Statements on mediation. Statements on minister, employee, or volunteer guidelines. Statement policy for the use of our building or church property. Church facility reservations request and agreement form. Those things are all there to protect us. To protect not only this building which you set in and from any kind of civil suit, but also to protect anyone who might uh, officiate or serve the congregation in the form of an elder or, or ministers. So this morning in your mailboxes, uh, you'll find a letter that's been generated by the eldership explaining in this announcement and how you, if you so desire, can access, access a copy uh, to be either read electronically or hard copy would be provided for you. As I said already, we live in the greatest country in the world. I, I believe that. I've traveled, you know, a little bit. You know, I've traveled through Europe and, and Africa, Africa and south of the border and, and north of the border. And there's some great countries out there, but we live in a great country. But our country's changing. And I don't know if it's for the good as much as it is maybe for not so good. But I know that we can make a difference. And if we can't, then we need to be able to stand strong as a body of believers. Let me say to you that I personally take no delight in preaching lessons such as this. But it's a lesson that I think is necessary and so the elders asked me to put it together and so I have done so so that you might be able just to give some consideration to the thoughts. Dave Riches, who's one of our other elders, is going to come forward and he has some other announcements in regards to what I've just said as well as some other things. So Dave. From the eldership, this is a sad day. In my uh, 50 plus years as a member of the church, I could not in my wildest dreams imagine that someday we would have to be creating policies to protect the church. But our government has forced us into doing this. And so we, uh, in a sad way, say, these policies are intended to protect all of us protect the church, protect our ministers, protect certainly our elders, but protect our resources as well because the, the downside of what's gonna happen is that somebody's gonna show up at the door and we're gonna turn them away and they're gonna sue us in court. And they're gonna be looking for money for remuneration because they feel like we have offended them. And so we have been challenged by uh, many um, uh, church-going attorneys that have asked us and given us advice to put these types of policies together. And so today, that's what you're going to find. At the end of service, a couple of the elders will be in the back with uh, hard copies of the policy, but I want to show you uh, quickly where you can go online on our website and uh, see those policies. Um, we need to back up one screen, if you will, from that screen. We need to go to the, to the website. <laughs> our challenge is that when we move the project or the computer screen monitor to this we have to use this little cursor to get to where we're at and uh, it doesn't show up back there so it's hard to see this is our website uh, for those of you hopefully all of you have uh, seen our website um, but um, as as with all websites one of the things that we have uh, spent a great deal of um, challenge to do is to try to keep personal items safe. Um, and so many of you may have come to this website and we have a member login site or a member site that doesn't have all of the 
private stuff, if you will, telephone numbers, addresses, that kind of thing. Uh, we try to keep that safe. And many of you, I've heard, haven't been able to find that. And so I want to walk through that because that's where we've put these policies on the member page. And so you're going to have to go to the member page to see it. So in order to find the um, member page, you need to come clear down to the bottom of the website. And right here by copyright, it says Linda Road Church of Christ. If you'll click on that, that will take you to the sign in to the member page and uh, it's going to ask for a username and password. If you haven't got those yet, if you haven't asked for that, Lori, please see her. She'll provide that to you, and you just uh, put that in, and then, then your, the member page will be opened up. So hopefully... Um, if you'll note on the left side of... Left side from the elders church policies. If you'll click on that, that will open up the church policies as Richard showed you, and you can go down through that and uh, read that online at your uh, leisure. Um, and uh, we encourage you to do that. It's an important document, we believe. Uh, again, one that we're sad to even have to think about creating, but uh, we've been forced to do that. And if you would rather just have a hard copy, you don't use a computer or the internet, uh, then we'll be, a couple of the elders will be at the back at the uh, end um, and provide those to you. Thank you so much. country but we're being called as citizens to make some stands we you know we, we uh, live in the great Say 